What's up everyone, it's your favorite non-Hispanic gentleman, except I may be Hispanic, you actually don't know. I'm gonna try a new series today, which is me talking about football, soccer, whichever you wanna call it. Basically, I spend most of my Saturday mornings watching this when I'm not torturing myself with FIFA Weekend League, and I thought I might as well share it with you all because some of you guys like to talk about it anyway. Now, I'm not gonna claim to be the biggest tactical genius when it comes to football. Uh, I also don't think I'm completely oblivious to everything. I also don't claim to be the best person in terms of reading statistics and understanding statistics. But what I'm going to try to do is look at, these are games that I watched today. Every time that I do a video like this, it's going to be a game that I actually watched. And then I'm also going to look at the statistics during the game and after the game. I don't believe that you can just watch a game and understand fully what happened because a lot of the times you don't get a full picture of what happened. It's hard to remember statistics. It starts to realize who did what. And I don't also, I also don't believe that you can just look at statistics solely and then base your judgments off of that, just deciding who did well, who was the best player. So what I'm going to try to do is combine the two. I'm taking, I took notes throughout these games, just taking notes about things that happened, large actions that I thought were notable. And I also looked at the Who Scored, which is a website that tracks a lot of details, like from dribbling, from passing, aerial duels won, all sorts of things. I kept notes of that, and I also am going to look at it uh, to show you guys. And I'm going to try to combine the two to give you all a picture of what happened. I'll also give my opinion going throughout it. You can debate me down below. Debate me. Fight me afterwards. I'll shave my head like Kyle Walker if you win. Anyway, I, I tried to do this earlier and I was basically just reading. I have a summary just to remind myself of what happened. I don't want to summarize the game. You guys can just watch the highlights if you want. You should probably do that before if you didn't watch the game itself. But basically in the first half, in the first 20 minutes of the West Ham Man City game, the first game that I watched today, I didn't do Norwich Liverpool because I was at work yesterday. But in the first 20 minutes, West Ham didn't look that bad. People are going to see the 5 0 scoreline and see West Ham in shambles. Destroy West Ham, destroy the entire club. But really, first 20 minutes, they didn't look that bad. Sebastian Haller, the new signing, he was holding up play very well. He was distributing it very well to the right-hand side. They had Felipe Anderson, who has moved from the left-hand side. Left-hand side now, Manuel Lanzini. Um, and then in the middle, well, kind of drifting around Mikel Antonio, uh, I guess playing in behind, and then he would be, he would go and try to drag the center backs away to provide space when Sebastian Haller would drop deep. But they didn't do that poorly. They just didn't have an end product in the first 20 or so minutes. Man City started off pretty slow, but they did get a little bit back into the game, mainly down the right-hand side, attacking Aaron Cresswell, who isn't very pacey. He does have a good left foot on him, but Kyle Walker, Riyad Mahrez proved to be too much for him. It led to a goal, and basically throughout the entire first half, they were attacking that right-hand side, and it led to a lot of difficulties for West Ham. The first goal happened in the 21st minute, or the 24th? Yeah, the 24th minute, and what happens is they score that goal, Man City does, and then immediately after, West Ham, I don't know if it's a combination, if it's West Ham kind of being West Ham and freaking out when they score, when they concede a goal, or if it's Man City being Man City and realizing, hey, we scored a goal, let's continue to just exploit this down the, down the right-hand side. So I don't know if it's a combination of the two. It might just be West Ham being West Ham or Man City understanding that they can exploit West Ham's left side because Aaron Cresswell can't defend everything by himself because he's not pace enough, Reed Mars is too tricky. So they just kept going back to that area. They should have scored early on, Mars should have, but he dragged a shot wide anyway. Uh, but right after they scored the goal, I thought they were gonna score again. They ended up not scoring, mainly because West Ham held on, but it was looking pretty dangerous. Some stats that I noted at halftime, uh, passes. So 232 West Ham completed passes as compared to 290 for Man City. And that is obviously in favor of Man City, but not to the point that you might expect it. If you go back to last year's, you'll see some crazy statistics. I'll show you in just a second. So this is the chart from the February 2019 game between West Ham and Man City at Man City, which is notable because usually the home team has more possessions, more passes completed when they're when they're playing. This is the full-time statistics as, to compared to, as compared to what I'll show you for today's halftime statistics, but 75% possession. 24% for West Ham. And then look at the total passes, 780 total passes for Man City, 255. 255 at full time for West Ham. Compare that to what they had at full time or at half time of today's game. So all that is to say two things. One, West Ham weren't playing terribly. I mean, it's not like they were playing to a level where they should have been tied or should have been winning, but they weren't terrible. The second thing to note, which I think is more important is, 
just because you have a million passes and because you have 90% possession doesn't mean you're the better team. West Ham didn't really do anything with their passes, whereas Man City was pretty efficient with their passes, creating chances off their opportunities. As we'll see later in the Tottenham game, possession stats don't always mean everything. You can see a couple of other not notable things. Aerial duels, 12 for West Ham, they're actually winning more. Loss of possession, Felipe Anderson and Lanzini were losing possession, not really doing anything with it. Sebastian Heller, I didn't look at the stat, but I would be surprised if he had lost the ball at all in the first half. He was playing really well. And then fouls is also notable. Eight total fouls for Manchester City. A lot of those came from Rodri, the new signing from Spain, Atletico Madrid. Mainly him being tactical. People complain in the, in the uh, match thread Reddit that he just always does this. This is typical Man City, and it is kind of typical Man City. Whenever they lose possession, they don't want to be caught out. That's where a lot of the goals concede, that they concede happen from, just being out of position because of how far they push their fullbacks forward. So, Rodri's job is to take tactical fouls, do it in a manner, sort of like Casemiro, that's not so aggressive that it is warranting a yellow card, but to a point where it stops play. Second half was where it all crumbled for West Ham. I, you should just watch the highlights to see some of the incredible play, the int intricate play that Man City is just combining. There was one, the, the goal that was disallowed by VAR, it was a pass from Zinchenko into David Silva who did a no look, left footed pass into Raheem Sterling who had already started his move as Zinchenko still had the ball. So the fourth guy in that move, he runs down, that Sterling that I'm talking about, he runs down, fires a ball across, uh, Jesus should have done the Bobby Firmino tap in where he doesn't even look at it, but he decided not to because he's lame. Anyway, that was canceled out because he was offside by an armpit hair, which is incredible. If that was my armpit hair, that would be noteworthy though. Another thing to note was there were a lot of injuries for West Ham. Felipe Anderson got injured at one point. Um, I don't, Jack Wilshire got injured. That's Jack Wilshire, but he, he got injured. You know, Jack Wilshire. And also the announcers were noting that and I, I kind of noticed this too, that the West Ham players didn't look as fit as Man City. It could be that Pep is such a crazy bald man that he makes them run a thousand miles and they just have to be in pitch, in peak performance if they want to play. Or it could also be that Pellegrini doesn't get his side into the greatest shape ever. He doesn't seem, I mean, this is just my opinion. I don't know Manuel Pellegrini at all, but it seems like he doesn't have the iron fist ruling that Pep Guardiola has. Pep Guardiola tells people if you're tired, you can go duck yourself. Anyway, second half happened, and unfortunately for West Ham, it just meant that Man City obliterated them. It just intricate play, midfield of West Ham kind of getting too far deep, and then at times when they're in transition trying to join the attack, getting caught too far upfield. It was Kevin De Bruyne running, just running shop in the center, center of the park, Raheem Sterling running down the left-hand side, being too far in front. And this was against Ryan Fredericks, who's a very quick, I think he's even quicker than Raheem Sterling. But because of his job to try to also get forward in attack, he was having trouble keeping up with Raheem Sterling, also people trying to close down Kevin De Bruyne. Uh, the second goal was just really bad defending. The midfield was non-existent for West Ham. And that just con that theme continued throughout the game, and that's why it ended 5-0. Uh, I did th my cat did throw up at the in the 90th minute, so I missed the last goal. Um, I'm sorry, Raheem Sterling. I apologize. That game finished 5-0. Um, total passes 402 for West Ham, 545 for Manchester City. Uh, Gundogan. This is the same formation, the 4-3-3 that they played against Man er, against West Ham in February, except instead of Rodri, it was Gundogan. So I'm going to focus on Rodri because people kind of said that he wasn't good. People were saying they should have bought Declan Rice and said Declan Rice seemed to have a pretty good game. I actually haven't looked at his statistics, so I don't know. But then people were giving a lot of stick to, to Rodri. And let's see, was it warranted? So let's look at Ilkay Gundogan, who is sort of playing a similar role. It's like the Fernandinho role, although Fernandinho supposedly is going to play center back this year. Passes, he had 90 total passes, 84 of them being accurate. That's 93% pass accuracy. That's pretty good. Looking at the aerial duel one, he had four aerial duels, six defensive duels, but that's not terrible for Ilkay Gundogan's not even that tall, 180 centimeters. He's not the kind of person who's just gonna dominate the midfield. He's more of a tactical player, but those, that, those numbers are pretty decent. You can see tackles as well, two total tackles, one interception. So overall, his rating was a 7.27, which 
for who scored isn't terrible. Now let's compare it to Rodrigo, Rodri, as he played today. He had 71 total passes, 65 being accurate, so 92% pass accuracy as compared to 93 for Gundogan. Yeah, a slight difference, but still pretty good, 92%. In terms of aerial duels won, he had a total of 5 aerials won, 4 defensive, 1 offensive, so even better numbers. Rodrigo is 6'3", so 11 total centimeters taller than what Gundogan is and that presence was felt in terms of the aerial duels won. You can see the details for tackles. He had three successful tackles. He missed one, was dribbled, got around once, and then also dispossession. This is this is why people are saying that Rodrigo wasn't good, why he didn't have a good game, because he had that really bad dispos or dispossession in the first half, which almost led to a West Ham goal. People are going to keep that in mind because it, was, it led to a goal scoring opportunity. Now, obviously, it's a bigger deal if you get dispossessed there as opposed to dispossessed in the attacking corner. But it's hard to get, it's hard to really pinpoint one moment in a game and say everything else doesn't matter. Just as a comparison, he played an 8.1 for his total rating, 8.07 if you want to not round because you're a nerd, uh, which is higher than what Gundogan had. So overall, Rodrigo, did I think he had a great game? No, he had some errors. He looked a little bit shaky at times. But did he have a terrible game? Should he be sold already? Should Declan Rice become the new heir to the throne? No, it was one game.